This is the second video on issues arising, and it's looking at this section, which states how worthwhile is the pursuit of happiness, and is it all that people desire? So, firstly, how worthwhile is the pursuit of happiness? Well, Schopenhauer, a nihilistic, miserable German philosopher who had tremendous influence, kind of sadly really, because um, he inspired Nietzsche, who then went on to in part inspire fascism, said that it wasn't worthwhile at all to pursue happiness. Life was a veil of tears, full of suffering, and all happiness is an illusion. Life oscillates like a pendulum, back and forth between the pain and boredom. And each life history is a story of suffering, a continuing series of large and small accidents. Schopenhauer thought that happiness um, is when we want something, and then we satisfy that wish, and that in turn brings about a new wish, and then we try and satisfy that, and this is kind of ceaseless, endless process. Therefore, chasing after happiness was a fool's errand. How worthwhile is it? Well, Schopenhauer has his, um, has his say about that. But the pursuit of happiness, that's the next part of this question, and that's worth analysing. The pursuit of happiness, it seems, again, might be a bit of a mistake. And if this is true, the whole of utilitarianism is a bit pointless. Viktor Frankl, um, in a book called Man's Search for Meaning, says that pursuing happiness won't make you happy. Happiness is a side effect. You get it by pursuing something else, by dedication to a cause greater than yourself. And even John Stuart Mill says that chasing after happiness doesn't really work. Those only are happy, I thought, who have their minds fixed on some object other than their happiness. Aiming thus at something else, they find happiness along the way. If you ask yourself whether you're happy, you cease to be so. So the whole point of trying to work out what makes us happy, again, might be problematic. This point is illustrated really well by Jonathan Haidt in his book, The Happiness Hypothesis. Haidt gives us several scenarios and asks us to choose what we would rather be or who we would rather be. So in this instance, there is Bob. And Bob is rich, he's young, he's good looking, he works in Silicon Valley in America, he's incredibly highly paid, he's got a flash sports car, he lives on his own in a wonderful apartment, um, he's successful. And Sharon, um, she's disabled, she lives close to Canada in the kind of frozen north of the country, she's got a long term partner, she's been happily married for many many years, and uh, she's part of a, a minority group that often doesn't get great treatment in America. So who would you rather be? Most people would say, well, Bob, easily, definitely, 100%. Can I be Bob now, please? But studies show that Sharon would probably be happier. She's in a long-term relationship after all. And that is what really makes you happy, studies apparently show. Which would you rather have, a long commute and live in a beautiful house out in the countryside that looks like that and it's blue and everything? Or would you like a short commute from your job to home, but you live in a pokey apartment complex um, in, a, in part of the inner city London? Again, most people favour the long commute and living in a palatial home. But the people who favour a short commute and go for that are generally happier. Which would you rather have? A few holidays a year, but all the consumer goods that you can buy, or lots of holidays a year, um, but you're quite poor? Again, most people would go for option A, but studies show option B is going to make you happier, and this is why teachers are so over the moon all the time. Four, this is a, an interesting one. What would you rather do? Um have a beautiful gelato and an ice cream made by some Italian craftsman and you can just knock yourself out by having 20 different scoops and it's the most beautiful thing in the world or call a relative. Again, virtually all of us would pick the ecstatic ice cream van but we'd have been making a mistake. You see, when you eat an ice cream, it's over, and ten minutes later, you've kind of forgotten how good it was. And if anything, you'd wish you had more. 
Whereas when you call a relative, it might not feel great at the time, but 10 minutes later, an hour later, five hours later, five days later, you feel happy that you've nourished an important relationship in your life. So if you want to be happy, don't eat the ice cream, call a relative. And finally, this is a fascinating example that he uses. Who would you rather be, a lottery winner or a paraplegic? Again, I'm sure everyone would pick a lottery winner. However, lottery winners tend to be very unhappy, whereas paraplegics tend to be quite happy, according to studies. Again, we are terrible at predicting what makes us happy. And therefore, this seems to be a big problem for utilitarianism. So, how worthwhile is it? Well, Schopenhauer said not very worthwhile. And the pursuit of happiness, well, Haidt says we're kind of rubbish at predicting what makes us happy. And Franklin Mill say chasing happiness actually makes us actively unhappy. The next part of this question that we should look at is, is that all that people desire? Well, I don't think it is. And in fact, I've got quite a long list here of things that I think people desire. Firstly, I think people are interested, some people anyway, in satisfying God. Here are a list of commandments, 613 of which Jewish people must follow, Orthodox Jews follow um, to the letter. Some of these are quite tricky to follow, and, and number 17 presumably is very painful as well. And some just make very interesting reading. The important thing, though, is that Jewish people think following these rules is the most important thing, because in this way they can satisfy God. And by satisfying God, they make themselves happy. But happiness isn't the goal. Choosing a happy life is not the correct thing to do. You're supposed to satisfy God regardless of the personal consequences. The fact that so many people live lives like this, in particular in the Abrahamic faiths of Christianity, Islam and Judaism, suggests that happiness isn't the only thing that people are searching after. In modern Western society, you can see all the ones highlighted in that light blue. We're kind of encouraged to get rich, get powerful, get attractive sexual partners and get fit and get respect. And I think that's embodied um, really clearly in rap culture. And you can see these frames taken from videos and, and album artwork that shows that um, money and power and sex and status... They seem to be goals in and of themselves, regardless of whether or not they're making people happy. Sure, all of those things have an instrumental value. They can be derivatives of happiness, or they can make you happy. So you could argue that the end goal was happiness all along. However, I am sure that if you offered many people um, great riches, great power, um, many attractive sexual partners, um, incredible physical uh, physiques, and all round respect and status from their peers and a slightly diminished level of happiness than they would get if they lived a life of anonymity, I'm sure that the majority of people would pick getting rich, powerful, and etc. This seems to suggest that they have value in and of themselves. They have intrinsic value. And utilitarianism doesn't seem to acknowledge that. In a more wholesome way, some people would like to get wise, not because it's going to make them happy. In fact, studying philosophy can often make you very unhappy and being um, cut adrift from your ethical foundations, which might be happening during this course, can make you unhappy. But wisdom itself seems to have value. Other people devote their lives to building something, whether it be a, a corporation like Apple or a masterpiece like Michelangelo's David. People will subordinate their happiness in order to achieve this greater, higher goal. They might also think that their happiness is of less importance than caring for other people, like Mother Teresa, or for doing their duty. When people responded to conscription in 1916, I'm sure many of the men who were called up knew that fighting in the trenches would not make them happy. 
wouldn't make their family happy, and they might have had objections to the war in the first place, so they wouldn't have even thought winning it would make the country better off or the world happy. And yet it was their duty. They thought it was more important to do their duty than worry about their happiness. So you can see quite an exhaustive exhaustive list there of things that people could prioritise rather than happiness. So getting back to the question then, is it all that people desire? Well, no, they desire all manner of different things. And then finally, on that point about desiring, remember there is the naturalistic fallacy. And this states that even though people might desire something, that doesn't mean that it is worth desiring or that it should be desired. You can't get an ought from an is. You can't say it ought to be desired or the pursuit of happiness ought to be desired in this case simply because it is desired. For example, the fact that people eat meat does not prove that they ought to eat meat or that eating meat is good. The fact that investment banks do avoid tax doesn't mean that it's proof that such an activity is good. So we could query that aspect of the question. These then are all the moving parts of the question. These are all different aspects that we can pick up and analyse and evaluate in order to make our answer to this AO2 question interesting and insightful. You can see what the exam board expect here and again hopefully you'll see that they're not being too ambitious in what they expect you to produce in 12 and a half minutes.